Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for January 24th through 30th, 2022. This is covering Moses chapter 7. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. So happy to see you today. You look particularly unified today. It's beautiful. (laughs) So now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 18 minutes, 17 seconds. Very easy. What would it be daily? 2 minutes, 36 seconds. So simple to do. Make sure we spend some time and dig into those verses. Here we've got time codes that are just for Moses chapter 7. So, (laughs) you know, buckle up. Let's talk about it together. Well, and I'll second what Jay implied. Take some extra time. There are some deep subjects in this particular chapter. Take some time to ponder. Now, in our last lesson, we introduced Enoch, Adam's great-great-great-great-grandson. He has started preaching and teaching to the people. And remember... All of Enoch's fathers and grandfathers, including Adam, are still alive at this time. Also remember that this chapter, Moses chapter 7, is part of an excerpt from the book of Enoch, a book we do not have in its entirety today, but we're grateful for what we have. Let's start then with Moses chapter 7. Let's take a look at verse 1. And it came to pass that Enoch continued his speech, saying, Behold, our father Adam taught these things, and many have believed and become the sons of God, and many have believed not, and have perished in their sins, and are looking forth with fear in torment for the fiery indignation of the wrath of God to be poured out upon them. I love that Enoch points out that this is not necessarily anything new, that this was something that Adam had preached from the beginning, And from the beginning, some had received it and some had not. Well, and you'll notice in that verse something that we're going to see explored throughout the chapter, and that is many who believe and become sons of God and those who choose not to and perish in their sins. So that idea of those consequences, what our choices will help us to become or not become. Now, I want to point this out, too. We talked about this in a previous lesson that term, sons of God, we are, of course, all sons and daughters of God. But this was a term that seemed to be used to designate someone who was like a member of the church. They were called sons of God. So in verse 2, Enoch shares a vision that he received on top of Mount Simeon. Right. And where's Mount Simeon? We don't know. But I'm sure it was a mountain. Yes. Starting in verse 3. And it came to pass that I turned and went up on the mount, and as I stood upon the mount, I beheld the heavens open, and I was clothed upon with glory, and I saw the Lord, and he stood before my face, and he talked with me, even as a man talketh one with another face to face. And he said unto me, Look, and I will show unto thee the world for the space of many generations." Now, the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual has an extra quote from President Brigham Young on the concept of speaking to the Lord face to face. He says, quote, Man is made in the image of his maker. He is his exact image, having eye for eye, forehead for forehead, eyebrows for eyebrows, nose for nose, cheekbones for cheekbones, mouth for mouth, chin for chin, ears for ears, precisely like our Father in heaven, end quote. That comes from a discourse that he gave that was recorded in Deseret News, July 21st, 1869. It's a great reminder. This is another area in Scripture where we're reminded that the image of God is our image, is a human image. Now, in the next few verses, verses 5 to 7, Enoch sees a vision of a great nation of tent dwellers named Shum and another nation of tent dwellers named Canaan. Canaan will conquer Shum and divide themselves in the land, and the land shall be barren and unfruitful, and none other people shall dwell there but the people of Canaan. What's interesting about that is perhaps divide themselves might imply that not only were they warlike in taking over Shum, but that they were also divisive amongst themselves. 
And this is such an interesting contrast to what Enix people are going to be. Again, for those who rebel against the Lord, we have this idea of divisiveness, dividing themselves. Think of in the Book of Mormon when people became ites, various ites. They have loyalties outside of God. And we're going to see something different with Enoch and his followers. Let's go to verse 8. For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and the barrenness thereof shall go forth forever. And there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, and they were despised among all people. Now, that phrase can be uncomfortable when reading it, the idea of blackness coming upon the children of Canaan. But just as we do today, the Old Testament writers use certain colors in a metaphorical way relating to people. Today, we might say that someone is feeling blue or is green with envy, red with rage. Or if we were a cowboy, we might call a coward yella. <laughs> hey, are you yella? Blackness is used by the Old Testament authors metaphorically to indicate a depressed and gloomy countenance. You can see in these examples in Joel 2.6, Jeremiah 8.21, Nahum 2.10, that our footnotes can help us to see the use of a Hebrew idiom in the use of the term blackness. So because the people of Canaan rejected the Lord, he has cursed the land and it became hot and barren. As a result of living in such a place, the children of Canaan had a dark and gloomy countenance and as a result were despised among all people. The idea of race is a more modern concept. True Old Testament authors are concerned about lineage, but race doesn't play into that. Remember that today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse. That's from the Gospel Topics essays, Race and the Priesthood. So don't make the mistake of reading the scriptures with that modern day idea in mind. If you're interested in further discussion on this topic, we might recommend the video Black and White in the Book of Mormon. It's on the Brother Fulmer channel, and we'll link to it in the description. Now, going on in verses 9 through 12, Enoch was shown seven different lands and was instructed to preach repentance to them and baptize those who would enter into that covenant. But verse 12 tells us that he did not preach in Canaan. Why? Well, it doesn't say, but there are various reasons a servant of the Lord might not preach. It may be that it is not time for preaching to happen there, as in the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples regarding not preaching to the Gentiles yet. But of course, then that time came. It could also be forbidden because the people have repeatedly and openly rebelled against the teachings already given, such as with Mormon in Mormon chapter 1. Considering what we've learned about the people of Canaan already in verse 8, it seems that that's probably a more likely reason. And remember the directive to preach to the people and to not preach to the people, that's coming from the Lord. And so if he knows that a group of people have been given opportunity to hear the word and have consciously rejected it, that is his decision as to whether or not he will send his servants there. Let's take a look at verse 13. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord and the earth trembled and the mountains fled, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch and so great was was the power of the language which God had given him. Wow. Now, do you remember our last lesson when we talked about Enoch's insecurity? Right. He was a lad. The people hated him. He was slow of speech. What did the Lord make of that? Yeah. He is a powerhouse. Yep. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual, we get this quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie from his book, The Mortal Messiah, From Bethlehem to Calvary. He helps us understand this about faith. Quote, faith is power. By faith, the worlds were made. Nothing is impossible to those who have faith. If the earth itself came rolling into existence by faith, surely a mere mountain can be removed. 
by that same power, end quote. Good point. Going on to verse 14, there also came up a land out of the depth of the sea, and so great was the fear of the enemies of the people of God that they fled and stood afar off and went upon the land which came up out of the depth of the sea. So wait, what was this land? We don't know. But the important point is that the enemies of God were so afraid they would flee anywhere to get away. Yep. And certainly a land just coming up spontaneously out of the sea wouldn't seem perhaps the most stable choice, but they took it anyway. <laughs> right. And to John's point, I think that's the key. Where we don't have answers given, it's not important that we know everything except what was the purpose of the author in telling us that. And I think what John said is exactly what the intention was. Let's go on to verse 16. And from that time forth, there were wars and bloodshed among them. But the Lord came and dwelt with his people, and they dwelt in righteousness. The fear of the Lord was upon all nations. So great was the glory of the Lord, which was upon his people. And the Lord blessed the land, and they were blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places and did flourish. And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. And Enoch continued his preaching in righteousness unto the people of God. And it came to pass in his days that he built a city that was called the city of holiness, even Zion. Now, there's some key things to point out in these verses. Number one, and perhaps the most amazing, the Lord came and dwelt with his people there in verse 16. This is more than the people of Zion receiving God's word or presence through Enoch. It seems to me the Lord was there in person. And that's an interesting thing to contemplate. There are other things it could mean. For example, the presence of God among the people is, we see that throughout the Old Testament when the Lord is in a pillar of fire or in his tabernacle, that his presence is among the people. But we also have times when people are, like we've just read with Enoch, in the presence of God. In the case of Moses, it talked about how his countenance would shine after being in the presence of the Lord. And we do have imagery of that in these verses. Like in verse 17, so great was the glory of the Lord, which was upon the people. And maybe that's because, you know, his presence was truly there. So food for thought. Right. We don't know for sure what that means, but there is clearly a strong divine presence of some kind. Yeah. Number two, even among the warring nations, there was a fear of the Lord upon all nations. Does this remind you of the prophecy that we talked about last year in Doctrine and Covenants 45, verse 70, where it says, And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. Yeah, good parallel. And number three, Zion is the name the Lord gives, and it is to describe a people that are of one heart and one mind. And what was the result of that unity? There was no poor among them. Oddly enough, that was the result not from focusing on the poor, but from uniting yourself with Jesus Christ. And that was just a natural consequence. Yeah, that's a really good point. And again, what does it mean that there was no poor among them? Does it mean that everyone had the same amount of wealth? Does it mean that everyone had what they needed? I'm sure it applies to temporal things, but I think we should also pay attention to its spiritual significance, that there was no spiritually poor among them. And why? Maybe because these people became so good at their ministering responsibilities that they continued to help to lift up and bless and that others were open to having their hearts changed. You know, it's just the most beautiful image of what we are supposed to be as disciples of Jesus Christ. The Pearl of Great Price Institute manual brings up one more point about verse 19. It says, Enoch's city had two names. Zion and City of Holiness. The second name becomes more meaningful when we remember that Heavenly Father's name in the language of Adam is Man of Holiness. I thought that was neat. So here we have God, Man of Holiness, and this city 
His city with his people is the city of holiness. Nice. Let's go back to the chapter, verse 20. And it came to pass that Enoch talked with the Lord, and he said unto the Lord, Surely Zion shall dwell in safety forever. But the Lord said unto Enoch, Zion have I blessed, but the residue of the people have I cursed. So what does it mean to be cursed? Did you notice in this verse the use of opposites, blessing and cursing? Sometimes the land is cursed, which we've seen in verse 8. We also saw this in part of the fall where the earth was cursed for Adam and Eve and in other places in the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon. When people are cursed, it's often part of an illustration of the opposite. Moses, after reminding his people of the commandments and promises of the Lord, also reviews the consequences of sin. So that in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, he says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. You know, that feels good to say, choose life. We haven't said that for a while. Anyway, Blessing and cursing are terms used to describe the consequences of obedience or sin. Alma 3.19 reminds us that every man brings upon himself his own curse. And verse 14 in that same chapter gives us the antidote to a cursing, repentance. So rather than thinking of a curse like we do, say, in a fairy tale story, its use in biblical terms might be better thought of as consequences for sin or a withholding of blessings because of a lack of obedience. Good point. Let's go back to the chapter, verse 21. And it came to pass that the Lord showed unto Enoch all the inhabitants of the earth. And he beheld, and lo, Zion in process of time was taken up into heaven. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold mine abode forever. So Enoch and his people were translated and also Enoch saw all the inhabitants of the earth, so take a moment to wave to him. <laughs> it's interesting to me that there's a key phrase that's often ignored in verse 21. I think we tend to think about the translation of the city of Enoch as this one instantaneous group translation, but that's not what is described. It says that Zion, in process of time, was taken up into heaven. To me, this implies that some people had received translation early on, but others remained and received it later. The scriptures don't specify how long the process took, but eventually all were translated. Yeah, and you know, I have to admit, of course, I've noticed that phrase in process of time, but the way I interpreted it was that over the course of time, the instantaneous thing (laughs) happened, which, I mean, I guess that's possible, except that the way you're describing it here as something that happened over time fits well with what we're going to see in future verses where people continue to get added to this Zion community. So, yeah, that's a great observation. But let's talk more about what being translated even means. From our trusty guide to the scriptures, it describes translated beings as persons who are changed so that they do not experience pain or death until their resurrection to immortality. And the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual adds this quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. This is from his book, Answers to Gospel Questions. He says, quote, Translated beings are still mortal and will have to pass through the experience of death or the separation of the spirit and the body, although this will be instantaneous. For the people of the city of Enoch, Elijah, and others who received this great blessing in ancient times before the coming of our Lord could not have received the resurrection or the change from mortality to immortality, because our Lord had not yet paid the debt which frees us from mortality and grants to us the resurrection. End quote. Great point. And from the same institute manual, this quote from the prophet Joseph Smith, from an instruction on priesthood on October 1840, he says, Many may have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and into an eternal fullness, but this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order, and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets, 
and who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. I think that's an important point. I know I've had discussions with people about beings that have been translated, and the reality is they will experience death, as we all do, but it will be a lot more instantaneous. Yes, indeed. Well, let's go on to verse 23. And after Zion was taken up into heaven, Enoch beheld, and lo, all the nations of the earth were before him. And there came generation upon generation, and Enoch was high and lifted up even in the bosom of the Father and of the Son of Man. And behold, the power of Satan was upon all the face of the earth. And he saw angels descending out of heaven, and he heard a loud voice saying, Woe, woe be unto the inhabitants of the earth. And he beheld Satan, and he had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced, And Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and Son, and the Holy Ghost fell on many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. So again, what interesting contrast we have. We have this love and compassion and caring and people being lifted up into heaven. And then we have the contrast of Satan, who uses a chain to bind people down, to block the light. You have the notion of the face of the earth is veiled with darkness. And he's laughing. His angels are rejoicing at how he's holding people back from their divine potential. Interesting contrast. We get this thought from the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual from Elder Bruce R. McConkie, his book, The Millennial Messiah. He says, quote, After those in the city of holiness were translated and taken up into heaven without tasting death, so that Zion as a people and a congregation had fled from the battle-scarred surface of the earth, the Lord sought others among men who would serve him. From the days of Enoch to the flood, new converts and true believers, except those needed to carry out the Lord's purposes among mortals, were translated, end quote. Nice. That may be part of that whole process of time, too. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, let's take a look in verse 28. And here we're going to see something, well, that's very surprising to Enoch. In verse 28, And it came to pass that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept. And Enoch bore record of it, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as rain upon the mountains? And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy, and from all eternity to all eternity? Notice here the difference between what Enoch thought God must be versus learning about his true nature. It seems that Enoch had the impression that if God is holy and from all eternity to all eternity, that that restricts him from feeling things that maybe he'd consider mortal feelings, like sorrow. But what's great about this interaction with the Lord is what he'll learn more about the nature of God. Let's go on to verse 30. And were it possible that man could number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creations. And thy curtains are stretched out still. And yet thou art there, and thy bosom is there. And also thou art just Thou art merciful and kind forever. Note here in verse 30 the use of the word bosom. The word bosom is often used to refer to a person's chest, which covers his heart. In Old Testament culture, the heart is the seat of inner life or true nature. The phrase, and yet thou art there, and thy bosom is there, indicates that although God has created innumerable worlds, He feels deep love and compassion for each one of his children, and that is a reflection of his true nature. Let's go on to verse 31. And thou hast taken Zion to thine own bosom from all thy creations, from all eternity to all eternity, and naught but peace, justice, and truth is the habitation of thy throne. And mercy shall go before thy face and have no end. How is it? Thou canst weep. So you see that Enoch is understanding all this about God, all of these things that he's describing. 
but there's more to learn. God can feel sorrow. And let's look for what his children do that brings him sorrow in the coming verses. In verse 32, the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands. And I gave unto them their knowledge. In the day I created them, and in the garden of Eden gave I unto man his agency. And unto thy brethren have I said, and also given commandment, that they should love one another, and that they should choose me, their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. It's interesting how he used the word blood here. It's likely referring to their hatred toward their own fellow men. But the use of blood is a reminder that they are all brothers and sisters, as he mentions at the beginning of verse 33, and unto thy brethren have I said. But also, if their own blood literally means family, what does that say about how they feel toward their father? So let's go on to verse 34. And the fire of mine indignation is kindled against them, and in my hot displeasure will I send in the floods upon them, for my fierce anger is kindled against them. Behold, I am God. Man of holiness is my name. Man of counsel is my name. And endless and eternal is my name also. Wherefore I can stretch forth mine hands and hold all the creations which I have made, and mine eye can pierce them also. And among all the workmanship of mine hands, there has not been so great wickedness as among thy brethren. But behold, their sins shall be upon the heads of their fathers. Satan shall be their father, and misery shall be their doom. And the whole heavens shall weep over them, even all the workmanship of mine hands. Wherefore should not the heavens weep, seeing these shall suffer? But behold, these which thine eyes are upon shall perish in the floods. Wait a minute. Is that a bit of foreshadowing? Spoiler alert. Tune in next lesson. Going on. And behold, I will shut them up. I have a prison I have prepared for them. And that which I have chosen hath pled before my face. Wherefore he suffereth for their sins, inasmuch as they will repent in the day that my chosen shall return unto me. And until that day they shall be in torment. Wherefore for this shall the heavens weep, yea, and all the workmanship of mine hands. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Enoch, and told Enoch all the doings of the children of men. Wherefore Enoch knew, and looked upon their wickedness and their misery, and wept, and stretched forth his arms, and his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. Now, first of all, that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And how wonderful that the hearts of God and those who want to follow him will feel what they feel when people are not limiting themselves from their eternal and divine potential. Now, there's an interesting term at the end of that verse, his bowels yearned. That's not necessarily an expression that we use today, and yet we still do something similar. Bowels in Old Testament culture were the seat of strong emotions. And in our culture, we think often of the heart as the place of strong emotions. But I kind of like the bowels. Think of it as your stomach. Because we often use the stomach to talk about feelings, because it actually does feel something. I feel hungry. I don't feel well. You know, we do naturally have feelings associated with our stomach. So when he says his bowels yearned, it's that place inside him that's the seat of strong emotions. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual, we have this quote from Elder Marion D. Hanks. This comes from the April 1980 General Conference, where he says, quote, God, from whom all blessings come, asked of his children only that they should love each other and choose him their father. But as in our day, many neither sought the Lord nor had love for each other. And when God foresaw the suffering that would inevitably follow this self-willed, rebellious course of sin, he wept. That, he told Enoch, was what he had to cry about. End quote. Also note in verse 39, that which I have chosen hath pled before my face. Who is 
that. The very next phrase makes that clear. Wherefore, he suffereth for their sins. Who suffers for sin? Well, he's referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that which I have chosen. Right. Great point. Let's go on to verse 42. And Enoch also saw Noah and his family, that the posterity of all the sons of Noah should be saved with a temporal salvation. Wherefore, Enoch saw that Noah built an ark, and that the Lord smiled upon it, and held it in his own hand. But upon the residue of the wicked, the floods came and swallowed them up. And as Enoch saw this, he had bitterness of soul, and wept over his brethren, and said unto the heavens, I will refuse to be comforted. But the Lord said unto Enoch, Lift up your heart, and be glad, and look. Now notice that he saw Noah. Noah would be Enoch's great-grandson. It's Enoch, then Methuselah, then Lamech, and then Noah. Note also in verse 44 that Enoch refuses to be comforted. But what is the Lord's response? What will he show him? Let's pay attention as we go forward. First, let's take a look at a quote from the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual. This is from Elder Neil A. Maxwell from the October 1987 General Conference. He says, If Enoch had not looked and been spiritually informed, he would have seen the human condition in isolation from the grand reality. If God were not there, Enoch's why would have become an unanswered scream of despair. At first, Enoch refused to be comforted. Finally, he saw God's plan. The later coming of the Messiah in the meridian of time and the eventual triumph of God's purposes. It's so important to have perspective So what does the Lord want Enoch to see that will presumably help him to feel better? Going back to the chapter, verse 45, And it came to pass that Enoch looked, and from Noah he beheld all the families of the earth. And he cried unto the Lord, saying, When shall the day of the Lord come? When shall the blood of the righteous be shed, that all they that mourn may be sanctified and have eternal life? And the Lord said, It shall be in the meridian of time, in the days of wickedness and vengeance. And behold, Enoch saw the day of the coming of the Son of Man, even in the flesh, and his soul rejoiced, saying, The righteous is lifted up, and the Lamb is slain from the foundation of the world, and through faith I am in the bosom of the Father, and behold, Zion is with me. And it came to pass that Enoch looked upon the earth, and he heard a voice from the bowels thereof, saying, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men. I am pained, I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. When shall I rest and be cleansed from the filthiness which is gone forth out of me? When will my Creator sanctify me that I may rest and righteousness for a season abide upon my face? Um, did that verse just say that the earth was talking? From the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual, we have this quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. This is from his book, Church History and Modern Revelation. He says, quote, The Lord here, in Doctrine and Covenants 88, informs us that the earth on which we dwell is a living thing, and that the time must come when it will be sanctified from all unrighteousness. In the Pearl of Great Price, when Enoch is conversing with the Lord, he hears the earth crying for deliverance from the iniquity upon her face. It is not the fault of the earth that wickedness prevails upon her face, for she has been true to the law which she received, and that law is the celestial law. Wherefore, the Lord says that the earth shall be sanctified from all unrighteousness. End quote. There's another interesting phrasing that you might have noticed as you look at those verses, starting in verse 45. When shall the blood of the righteous be shed? Notice that righteous there is capitalized. As you see Enoch using righteous as the title of Christ, you'll see it capitalized throughout those verses. So take a look for that. Same thing is true for Son of Man. Right. Look for that in capital letters. You are referring to the Savior. Right. Let's go on in verse 49 and take a look at the covenant of Enoch. And when Enoch heard the earth mourn, he wept and cried unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, Wilt thou not have compassion upon the earth? Wilt thou not bless the children of Noah? 
And it came to pass that Enoch continued his cry unto the Lord, saying, I ask thee, O Lord, in the name of thine only begotten, even Jesus Christ, that thou wilt have mercy upon Noah and his seed, that the earth might never more be covered by the floods. And the Lord could not withhold, and he covenanted with Enoch, and swear unto him with an oath that he would stay the floods, that he would call upon the children of Noah. And he sent forth an unalterable decree that a remnant of his seed should always be found among all nations while the earth should stand. Now, what's interesting is that later in Genesis chapter 6, verse 18, the Joseph Smith translation notes that Noah will be reminded of this covenant with Enoch, and the Lord will make the same covenant with Noah. Nice. Going on in verse 53, And the Lord said, Blessed is he through whose seed Messiah shall come. For he saith, I am Messiah, the King of Zion, the Rock of Heaven, which is broad as eternity, Whoso cometh in at the gate and climbeth up by me shall never fall. Wherefore, blessed are they of whom I have spoken, for they shall come forth with songs of everlasting joy. There are some profound names of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in that verse. Messiah means anointed one and is a Hebrew rendering. In the Greek, the word would be Christos or Christ. They mean the same thing. King of Zion. Paul and John would refer to Christ as a king of kings in the New Testament. Isn't it interesting that there is a specific kingdom mentioned here? He is king of Zion, his people, those who are of one heart and one mind. And finally, rock of heaven. I can't help but be reminded of Helaman in chapter 5, verse 12 in the Book of Mormon. And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation, that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, when all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe, because of the rock upon which ye are built." which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. Wonderful. Let's go on to verse 54. And it came to pass that Enoch cried unto the Lord, saying, When the Son of Man cometh in the flesh, shall the earth rest? I pray thee, show me these things. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Look. And he looked and beheld the Son of Man lifted up on the cross after the manner of men. And he heard a loud voice, and the heavens were veiled, and all the creations of God mourned, and the earth groaned, and the rocks were rent, and the saints arose, and were crowned at the right hand of the Son of Man with crowns of glory. Now from the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual, there's a quote from President Spencer W. Kimball in a conference report from April 1963. He says, These earth spasms? were a revolt by the created earth against the crucifixion of its creator. That's quite an image. Yeah. Going back to the chapter, verse 57, And as many of the spirits as were in prison came forth and stood on the right hand of God, and the remainder were reserved in chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual, we get this quote from President Howard W. Hunter, speaking of the importance of Christ's resurrection in this entire plan. This is from April 1986 General Conference. He says, quote, The doctrine of the resurrection is the single most fundamental and crucial doctrine in the Christian religion. It cannot be overemphasized, nor can it be disregarded. Without the resurrection... The gospel of Jesus Christ becomes a litany of wise sayings and seemingly unexplainable miracles, but sayings and miracles with no ultimate triumph. No, the ultimate triumph is in the ultimate miracle. For the first time in the history of mankind, one who was dead raised himself into living immortality. He was the Son of God, the Son of our immortal Father in heaven, and his triumph over physical and spiritual death is the good news every Christian tongue should speak, End quote. Amen to that. Let's go on to verse 58. And again Enoch wept, 
and cried unto the Lord, saying, When shall the earth rest? And Enoch beheld the Son of Man ascend up unto the Father. And he called unto the Lord, saying, Wilt thou not come again upon the earth? Forasmuch as thou art God, and I know thee, and thou hast sworn unto me, and commanded me that I should ask in the name of thine only begotten, thou hast made me, and given unto me the right to thy throne, and not of myself, but through thine own grace. Wherefore I ask thee, if thou wilt not come again on the earth. Now do you notice that the Spirit is leading Enoch down a path to further knowledge? He learns one part of the earth's history or Heavenly Father's plan, and he's led to the next. We have the benefit of hindsight. We're living in the fullness of times, but Enoch does not yet know about the second coming of Jesus Christ, but he's about to be taught. Well, and I love, too, that his inquiries mean that as he gets his answers, they make sense. The plan is being unveiled to him in a way that really helps him to understand the reason this is happening because of this, and you've felt this. In verse 59, Enoch brings up the idea of grace. If you look up grace in the gospel topics area of your gospel library app, it says this, grace is a gift from heavenly father given through his son, Jesus Christ. The word grace as used in the scriptures refers primarily to enabling power and spiritual healing offered through the mercy and love of Jesus Christ. No one can return to the presence of God without divine grace. Through the atonement, we all can be forgiven of our sins. We can become clean before God. To receive this enabling power, we must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, which includes having faith in him, repenting of our sins, being baptized, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and trying to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. The grace of God helps us every day. It strengthens us to do good works we could not do on our own. The Lord promised that if we humble ourselves before him and have faith in him, his grace will help us overcome all our personal weaknesses. Nice. Going back to the chapter, verse 60. And the Lord said unto Enoch, As I live, even so will I come in the last days in the days of wickedness and vengeance, to fulfill the oath which I have made unto you concerning the children of Noah. And the day shall come that the earth shall rest. But before that day the heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and great tribulation shall be among the children of men. But my people will I preserve, and righteousness will I send down out of heaven." And truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men. And righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood, to gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare, an holy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming." For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute manual, we have this quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. This comes from October 1986 General Conference. He explained that the Lord promised, quote, that righteousness would come from heaven and truth out of the earth. We have seen the marvelous fulfillment of that prophecy in our generation. The Book of Mormon has come forth out of the earth, filled with truth, serving as the very keystone of our religion. God has also sent down righteousness from heaven. The Father himself appeared with his Son to the prophet Joseph Smith, the angel Moroni, John the Baptist, Peter, James, and numerous other angels were directed by heaven to restore the necessary powers to the kingdom. Further, The prophet Joseph Smith received revelation after revelation from the heavens during the first critical years of the church's growth. These revelations have been preserved for us in the Doctrine and Covenants, end quote. Wonderful. Let's go on in verse 63. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there, and we will receive them into our bosom. 
and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual, President John Taylor offers this insight from a discourse recorded in the Deseret News in September of 1880. When the time comes that these calamities we read shall overtake the earth, those that are prepared will have the power of translation as they had in former times, and the city will be translated, and Zion that is on the earth will rise, and the Zion above will descend as we are told, and we will meet and fall on each other's necks and embrace and kiss each other. And thus the purposes of God to a certain extent will then be fulfilled. Now, this expression of falling upon each other's necks and kissing each other is a beautiful image of family love. It was the expression used in the parable of the prodigal son when the watchful father welcomes his son home. It's a great image. To Fall on each other's necks means to embrace, to wrap your arms around each other. Yeah, it's kind of a neck-to-neck type of thing. Yeah. Going back to the chapter, verse 64, And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made, and for the space of a thousand years the earth shall rest. And it came to pass that Enoch saw the day of the coming of the Son of Man in the last days, to dwell on the earth in righteousness for the space of a thousand years. From the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual, we have this quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. This is from his book, Answers to Gospel Questions. He says, quote, When the reign of Jesus Christ comes during the millennium, only those who have lived the telestial law will be removed. It is recorded in the Bible and other standard works of the church that the earth will be cleansed of all its corruption and wickedness, Those who have lived virtuous lives, who have been honest in their dealings with their fellow man, and have endeavored to do good to the best of their understanding, shall remain. The gospel will be taught far more intensely and with greater power during the millennium, until all the inhabitants of the earth shall embrace it. Satan shall be bound so that he cannot tempt any man. Should any man refuse to repent and accept the gospel under those conditions— then he would be accursed. Through the revelations given to the prophets, we learn that during the reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years, eventually all people will embrace the truth. End quote. Wonderful. Let's go on to verse 66. But before that day, he saw great tribulations among the wicked, and he also saw the sea, that it was troubled, and men's hearts failing them, looking forth with fear for the judgments of the Almighty God which should come upon the wicked. And the Lord showed Enoch all things, even unto the end of the world. And he saw the day of the righteous, the hour of their redemption, and received a fullness of joy. And all the days of Zion, in the days of Enoch, were three hundred and sixty-five years. And Enoch and all his people walked with God, and he dwelt in the midst of Zion. And it came to pass that Zion was not. For God received it up into his own bosom, and from thence went forth the saying, Zion is fled. Now from the Pearl of Great Price Institute Manual, President Brigham Young, from the teachings of the Presidents of the Church, Brigham Young, says, Enoch had to talk with and teach his people during a period of 360 years before he could get them prepared to enter into their rest. And then he obtained power to translate himself and his people. That's amazing. And remember, Zion fled in process of time. Now, whether that means that there was a process of time before an instantaneous fleeing, or if Zion fled over time, either way. It takes time. Yep. From the Come Follow Me manual, we get this great quote from Elder Ronald A. Rasband that I'd like to leave you with at the end of our lesson. This comes from October 2018 General Conference. He says, quote, Take heart, brothers and sisters. Yes, we live in perilous times, but as we stay on the covenant path, we need not fear. I bless you that as you do so, you will not be troubled by the times in which we live or the troubles that come your way. I bless you to choose to stand in holy places and be not moved. I bless you to believe in the promises of Jesus Christ 
that he lives and that he is watching over us, caring for us, and standing by us, end quote. I am so moved by the idea of Zion because we talk about it, but I think Enoch really illustrated in his conversation with the Lord what it means, how we should be feeling about one another, the kinds of interests we should have in the welfare of one another, and recognizing that these feelings, this divine love that we need to have in order to be completely unified, it only comes through the grace of Christ. And we can pray for that. We can reach for that. We can seek that. And that's a great example to me. And so how do we become unified? How do we become of one heart and one mind? It's not making the effort to become unified in thought and heart with each other, but to have all of us unify our hearts and minds with Jesus Christ. That is the key. And the rest is an extension. It happens naturally. Our relationships improve as we are unified in God through Christ. Well, what an amazing chapter of Scripture, and we're so grateful to have it. Yeah. I'm really glad that we got just one chapter this week so we could really sink our teeth into it. Well, as always, keep reading your scriptures, and we'll look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.